recording, okay. Just a second, please. Because there are interesting things that, um, you know, some e uh, bring to our attention. And I think if we have a chance to discuss about them, uh, it will be better. Uh, sorry, it's not this one. Um, okay. So, uh, slideshow. Okay, you probably see the, the screen at some zero two, right? It's it's zero two because I started this the other day. I mean, two days ago, uh, when uh, I talked about uh, uh, I even forgot what I talked about. Anyway, now we'll talk about something that I mentioned, that is the the fabulous uh, futuristic toilet that um, uh, Shigeru Ban uh, built in Tokyo. And I think uh, it's worth talking a little bit about this uh, great achievement of the Pritzker Prize Laureate. Because I think when we build temples for, I mean, sorry for the non-academic language, but when we build temples for uh, peeing and pooping, poo pooing, uh, I don't even know the word, pooing or pooping, you understand what I'm trying to say. It's a problem. And it's not because I'm a moralist, it's just that I think we reverse the order of things. I wrote here, Puing, yes, temples for Puing and Puing. So here we are, Shigeru Ban, sorry, I don't know how a letter disappeared, designs pair of transparent public toilets in Tokyo. Uh, Shigeru, uh, not, uh, Su Fujimoto did the same, um, not, well, one or two years ago. Uh, I don't know what's, what's with these Japanese. Why are they so tempted uh, to build uh, transparent uh, public toilets. I, 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 I am not a psychoanalyst, but I think here it is a subject worth, uh, you know, uh, dissecting a little bit. So this is the toilet, the great toilet that Shigeru Ban built. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's in the news now. I read a few days ago, two, three days ago. Apparently it uses a very sophisticated technology. Uh, when no one is there in the toilet, uh, the walls are com completely transparent. So you contemplate, you know, if the if if the if the if the spaces are clean and so on. And if you get in, automatically the the windows become opaque. But and also there is considered the virtue of the toilet that it leads up the park in Tokyo. But to me. There is a problem here. I understand the so-called uh, rational, uh, you know, explanations and the, the, you know, the reasons behind it somehow. But I see here a glorification almost in aesthetical terms, the aesthetization of, uh, of a function, which is, yes, it's, it's, it, it, it's part of life. But I think this is a unique moment in the history of the world where we don't build any longer for the gods, we build for uh, peeing and pooing. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we even transform them in aesthetical statements. Tadao Ando will do one. Uh, Fumihiko Maki will do one. Shigeru Ban did one. So only stars are invited to invest their, their creativity into, into these uh, uh, objects. So I read, Pritzker Prize winning architect Shigeru Ban has designed two public toilets for the Tokyo Toilet Project with transparent glass walls that become opaque when they are occupied. Built in the city's Yoyogi Fukamaki Mini Park and the whatever other community park, the pair of restrooms feature tinted glass walls to enable those approaching to easily check whether they are in use or not. Um, I actually think it's, it's, it's alarming when uh, this is the sumum, I mean, it's not the sumum, but, but the fact that in the 21st century, when we have so many other problems, we arrive at these, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, intensive aestheticizations of a function that is not really supposed to be, uh, you know, for contemplation. I'm sorry. Uh, this see-through quality was also selected to reassure users that the facilities are clean without them having to enter the toilet block first to check. For privacy, the glass walls become opaque once the occupant has entered and locked the door. 
great. But I actually get depressed. You know, uh, I think it's something uh, at least a little perverse here. You know, um, I don't know. I, we can talk about it. I don't want to be judgmental. I express my position. I would be curious what you think. So there are two things we worry about when entering a public restroom, especially those located at the park. Ban explained on the project's website. I don't know. I was never worried when I entered the public restroom. I don't know what he's talking about. The first is cleanliness, and the second is whether anyone is inside. Come on, Mr. Ban. I mean, you know, you open the door and you see clearly there's no one inside. I don't understand. Do we need this uh, complete transparency to see this? Using the latest technology, the exterior glass turns opaque when locked. This allows users to check the cleanliness and whether anyone is using the toilet from the outside. At night, the facility, fa facility lights up the park like a beautiful lantern. Now, when a park is lit up by a beautiful toilet, I'm beginning to worry, really, about the, 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 the age I live in. I, I really am. Do we need beautiful toilets to lit up our parks? I, I think it's something uh, upside down here, uh, but maybe I don't see far enough. I am, I'm willing to accept that I am blind. Um, anyway, so the new buildings replace two dated public toilets in a pair of small parks near the large Yoyogi Park. Each facility comprises three separate cubicles, a male, a female, and an accessible toilet, which I di divided by mirrored walls. Uh, I don't know what I keep missing. Uh, both structures were built according to the same design with the exception of the color of the glass walls. At the other community park, the glass is tinted with hues of green and blue to complement the surrounding trees, while the toilets at Yoyogi uh, Mini Park took cues from the nearby playground equipment featuring shades of orange, pink, and purple. Ah, yes, I remember now the first Atsum um, add some uh, <laughs> no addition of this uh, you know uh, thing this that I'm trying to to initiate was uh, um, showing uh, you know the the experience of the architecture of the ice cream. If you ever heard of something like this, the architecture of the ice cream, it is exactly how it is described in uh, Arch Davy a few days ago. I find it unbelievable the architecture of the ice cream. Anyway, um, so, Ben designed the colorful amenities as part of the Tokyo Toilet Project run by the non-pro, which enlisted the, the help of 16 creatives from around the world to redesign public toilets in 17 locations across the downtown district of Shibuya. Other participating designers and architects include Ken Gokuma, Mark Newson and Su Fujimoto, as well as fellow Pritzker Prize winners Toyo Ito, Tadao Ando, and Fumihiko Maki. I, 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 I'm speechless, you know, but uh, what do you expect? You expect we live at a time when Bill Gates, for example, and his wife some years ago invested I don't know how many millions to um, create a new uh, I always have problems with, uh, I confound condo with condom. I think condo, with a new condo, you know. Can you believe it? One of the richest men in the world are interested in, 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 in creating or discovering or funding a new condom, or con condom, I guess. I, I mean, I find it incredible. The, the, the frivolousness of our age, the banality, you know, I mean, don't we have enough of them? It, I don't understand it. But then on the other hand, uh, the same man, uh, Bill Gates, and I, I, I knew the architect who worked on, on, on the house, he, he lives still with his wife there. He has 27 bathrooms. Bill Gates has in his house 27 bathrooms, and he lives with his wife, and there are a few people who help, you know, with a... With a you know, with the matters in the house. But 27 bathrooms, and here is the man who wants to re revolutionize Africa by, uh, by uh, paying a lot of attention to water, uh, the management of the water, and so on, while himself in his house has 27 bathrooms. 
uh, I think a psychoanalyst would call all these people, um, you know, uh, because that's how they are called in uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, anal personalities. Anyway, at night the cubicles light up to make them easier to locate. Great. Now, I show you something else which was published today in China this time. It's a bridge. And please let me know if I am wrong. Maybe I am wrong. But it's something strange here. You see the bridge, this beautiful modern, uh, modernistic uh, structure. But there is another one here, you know, at a very short distance, which is the very opposite of this one, but still functions as a bridge. You can cross on these stones from one side to the other. It's true, without a roof, without an expensive structure, without a great team of engineers, without a lot of concrete, that, that pollutes the air and brings the climate change to further heights, this modest, very modest, but, but uh, efficient way of crossing from one side to the other is just, you know, a short distance from the other one. I find it strange. So, you know, we are in China here. The China, that China that gave to the world the great um, mystic, who wrote the incredibly beautiful and wise book called the Tao. I'm talking about Lao Tzu or Lao Tse. Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, I'm sure, would have been quite happy. Maybe this could have been enlarged. Maybe a few more stones could have been placed in between these large stones. And it could have functioned. Especially at a time when we are so concerned with climate change, with pollution, do we need to build you know, uh, massive structures that only add to the to the problems that we have. It's clearly this is this is made, and it's not a, a deep water here. You know, I I don't understand how you can make. Yes, it's a kind of an, a nice modern uh, build, uh, modern bridge, but I'm sure it was not the, the least expensive bridge, and it consumed a lot of resources. By the way of this, today I've heard on the radio, uh, Radio France Internationale, on the news that today it was published um, a report by a non-for-profit organization in the United States that the resources of the earth for 2020 have been consumed by today. And they, I don't know exactly how they measure these things, but for a good number of years they made statistics and 20 years ago, for example, uh, the day when the Earth consumed its resources was somewhere in November. And, and the closer we came to our time, the, the distance from, from that day and the end of the year increased. So slowly from November to October to, and so on, we arrived at, in August. Today, I mean, uh, on the 23rd of August, this organization published this report saying the resources of the earth for the year 2020 have been consumed. And if we really want to arrive at, at the end of the year, we need to consume 1.6 more resources. That would mean we need 1.6 earths with a plural. And in this context, when we know that we are abusing the earth, that we are polluting the air, that we are uh, um, creating dramatic changes in the climate. Do we need glorious uh, um, uh, new bridges when we have, when we have a functioning one, maybe too modest? Okay, enlarge it a little bit, adapt to it, but use it. And I'm not against architecture. I love architecture, but it's something wrong about pushing the limits of, 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 of uh, uh, you know, sustainability. Uh, so far and actually ignoring them. And I'm not a sustainabilist, uh, if, I, if there is such a word, there isn't. But I find it strange here that there is a bridge and then there is another bridge just 20 meters away or 30 meters away, um, which also has a roof, as if that <laughs> is uh, immensely important. Well, if it rains, okay, I guess it helps, but any roof, helps in case of a rain. So I, I find we are abusing the earth. This is what I'm trying to get at. And, and, and it's because of our vanity, you know. 
we want to leave behind something, you know, some signature building, some signature structures, and we cannot be modest. And by doing so, we are ruining the earth. Now, uh, on the opposite side, and with this, I end this introduction to today's meeting. Today, it was uh, published on the zine, uh, this interesting work, uh, a brickwork facade for the uh, government building in India. And it's interesting that this was published today on the day when Adolf Loos died. And you know very well that Adolf Loos was against ornament, although he did use it in his own buildings and uh, not, uh, not uh, in a insignificant way, but it's true, he used the ornaments of nature because he used marble with very rich uh, built-in uh, ornaments. But it's interesting that while he said that the more we advance into civilization, less ornaments we'll have. Well, look what is happening in India. This was built now, and it was published today in Dezin. You know, a building which has a clearly ornamental facade. And, uh, and uh, uh, I wonder what Mr. Adolf Loss would have thought, because this was... 20, uh, 100 years after he died, um, you know. So the ornament is coming back. This is without question true. And it's happening this in many ways, through parametry, through uh, even more advanced techniques, because apparently Patrick Schumacher considers parametry as uh, somehow belonging to a certain past or, you know, the orthodox parametry and we'll have a chance to talk about Patrick Schumacher um, on the 31st of August, because it will be his birthday, I think 31st or 30th of birthday of uh, August. But one thing is for sure, the ornament is coming back. After, you know, more than a century of modernity, the, the mental uh, disposition that makes ornament possible seems to have a comeback. And I think this is related to, to a certain longing for a contemplation, for a certain kind of beauty, and also maybe for some kind of... Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll arrive at Adolf Loos when we talk about him and ornament and crime. But here in India, uh, you know, they don't seem to reject the crime of ornament at all. And uh, I, I don't think they are uh, uh, on the wrong side of history. Look, this was done now, as, as I said, it was published today in the Zine. To be honest with you, I respect more this work than the, the uh, fabulous, uh, um, you know, uh, toilets built by Shigeru Ban and, and, and the other people. But I'm open to discussion about this. This is also about weaving, because here the, the, the bricks are woven in, uh, um, you know, more or less complex patterns. And uh, weaving, I think, is very, very important for architecture. In fact, the very word architecture is born from the oldest etymological root, which is tex, T kappa S, which in Sanskrit means to weave, but we forgot this. And look here also, you know, you could say it's a little bit naive, or, but I like it. It's, it's um, you know, I, I think we need this kind of so-called naivete and this kind of figuration again. Uh, too much abstraction and too much arrogance that derives from that abstraction, I'm, I'm not so sure it's so good any longer. Because it alienates us even further from the earth and from the past and maybe even from our own soul. Plus, here also we have some kind of narration. Maybe you understand. Maybe it's not so obscure, this narration. But I think we need our walls to talk again, to tell a story, to, to be more complex than just blank white walls. Okay, I end in this, uh, and I'm open to, to discussion if you want. Any opinion, any thought, any criticism, please speak up. 
if you want. Otherwise, I'll begin with Adolf Loss. But I am curious what you think about, uh, you know, the, the incredibly beautiful lantern uh, in uh, the Tokyo Park and the two bridges in China and the, the woven facade in, uh, in India. Okay, so I begin now with a presentation uh, that was the main uh, theme of today's meeting, that is uh, Adolf Loss. Uh, Adolf Loss, who made me think twice about him, uh, at least twice, um, and I explained why, and that's why in the invitations that I sent out, um, I, I played a little bit with, with his name, uh, Loss, Lose, and Loss, because, as I said, uh, this very important architect had a so-called dark side, that manifested itself uh, in uh, in very very questionable ways, and that is he he was sued. He was brought to court because he abused some young girls between eight years and eleven years uh, erotically, and uh, he was sentenced. But he didn't go to prison mainly because he had uh, friends in high positions. He was a respected and celebrated architect, and the documents disappeared. But they they were discovered in 2015 and you can find a lot of information about this on the web in fact if you want i can send you a link where there is in detail um, uh, explain the case but i knew this from the past that he had a very problematic relationship with women he loved women but he abused them and so he, he was a strange man he was also uh, for a good part of his life almost deaf so he didn't hear but i don't think you can legitimize what he did um, you know beyond his architecture because of that anyway but i like very much what he says here be not afraid of being called unfashionable i think this is very nice and i think we should have the courage that he is inviting us towards be not afraid of being called unfashionable. Unfortunately, many schools of architecture and many institutions and many magazines and e and so on, they all invite you towards the so-called mainstream aesthetics. Uh, and uh, by, by following that path, we might achieve a certain kind of so-called success. But I also think we are at risk of alienating ourselves from our deep self. So I think Adolf Loss is right when he's saying, be not afraid of being called unfashionable. In other words, be truthful to who you are. Um, yeah, so human beings are complex. You know, the same man who had problems with the justice also had brilliant um, uh, insights into, into architecture. He also said, I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. Well, this is not entirely true. And in fact, you are going to see a lot lots of plans, facades, and sections. But I think what he meant was that when he designed a building, he saw it as a, as a holistic uh, entity where the plans, the facades, and the sections, you know, uh, were intermingled. And so he thought that at the same time about all three of them and not in a, um, you know, a successive uh, uh, way. By the way of this, for example, Massimilian, we, we usually start the building by drawing plans, but there are architects like Massimiliano Fuchsas, who, for example, he declared he starts his buildings, the study of his buildings with a section, not with a plan. So it's possible. Or it's possible, like, uh, 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 you know, uh, Adolf Law said, uh, to, to, to get rid of, of the thought of plans, facades, or sections. Anyway, you will see some pictures of him. Uh, he was an intense man. He was an elegant man. He was an appealing man. I think he was a charming man, but a troubled man. Here you see a little bit, you see in his uh, right hand, uh, I don't have, uh, that's the photograph, but it's that object which helped him to hear better. Because he- Dan, have you started screen sharing? 
God, you only now they are telling me this crap. I don't believe this. You will. I've asked you several times. I thought you had slides in the very beginning, and because you told <laughs> very God, interesting. You know, why is this happening? Thank you, but thank you. Why you should tell me from the very beginning? How do I do this? I don't know why this is happening. You know, I, I'm embarrassed. Uh, but you again, you know, you were tortured, and I, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't. I, 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 I'm surprised. You know, so I have to. Yes, yes, yes. God. You know. Anyway, you didn't miss much because, um, but but still, now you see it, right? Yes, he's on. Huh. He's on. Well, thank you for telling me now and not at the end of the presentation. Anyway, he lived 63 uh, years, you know, born, uh, you know, in 1870. So he was actually, uh, let's see, let me calculate, uh, 17 years older than Le Corbusier, who was born in 18, no, no, uh, eight years, eight years older than Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier was born in 1878. I'm not wrong, or 1887, one of the two. Anyway, as you see, be not afraid of being called unfashionable. And I like this very much, this uh, uh, thought of his and his, uh, um, you know, uh, invitation towards us. And then he says, I do not draw plans, facades or sections. And now we see the pictures with him, uh, very elegant. Uh, and here is the, you know, the picture where I said, he had something in his right hand. There was an object that helped him hear better because he had big problems with hearing. And um, Goya too, the great uh, Spanish painter, lost his uh, hearing uh, uh, as Beethoven did also, but uh, they didn't indulge in uh, what uh, Mr. Adolf Loss did. Uh, so I don't think there is a connection between him being unable to hear and uh, his um, bizarre uh, behavior with young girls. Anyway, um, a very interesting architect, actually, you know, and um, uh, I think he's still and could be a source of, uh, of uh, a springboard for, for uh, a creativity that other architects are unable to inspire. Maybe exactly because of, of, uh, of uh, the tensions and the, uh, you know, the, the, the problems somehow, because his architecture has a, a certain problems as well, mainly because of his so-called rejection, violent rejection <coughs> of the ornament. Uh, before go, going to the drawing, I think I should, uh, you probably know, but I, I, will, I will just uh, describe in a few words the overview of that uh, essay, Ornament and Crime. His theory was that the more advanced a society, less ornaments. And, uh, and uh, he claimed that those people with ornamental um, longings uh, had criminal tendencies which they externalize through the, either, you know, embroidering a sweater or doing graffitis or tattooing themselves. Well, I have to inform Mr. Adolf Loss that in Vienna there are many tattooing shops. So obviously, and we cannot accuse Vienna of being an uncivilized city. In fact, it was considered the most civilized in the world and the most comfortable. But this, this didn't preclude the great city of Vienna of having many tattoo shops. So his theory is not quite legitimate. On the other hand, but he was a complex man because he understood the value of contemplation when a peasant uh, Slovak woman uh, uh, embroidered the sweater when she got lost almost in the, in the you know, in, in, in the act of uh, embroidering uh, uh, the, uh, the sweater. And, and in, that, in that activity, some kind of uh, ornamental impulse comes into being. Uh, and if we neglect that, that contemplative work that is connected with uh, orna ornaments, in fact, an interesting essay perhaps could be written about ornament and contemplation. Uh, on the other hand, another essay could be written called 
uh, structure and, and crime instead of ornament and crime. Because I think a building that is just structure uh, is not less criminal than one with an excessive ornamentation which is not legitimate. As some of the ornaments at the turn of the century probably were. And he had a reaction against them. But one thing is for sure, ornament is coming back and not because of criminal tendencies that were not externalized otherwise. On the other hand, I think the very word that he used, meaning crime, ornament and crime, already signaled something about himself. If you are so kind to turn off the, the, the microphone because I hear a background um, noise. I'm sorry, I have to do this because this is, uh, I have to mute this and uh, sorry about this. Uh, um, okay, do you see the, the screen with Adolf Loss? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, do. thank you. So in the future, please let me know because I don't know what you see. Okay, uh, so we move forward. Um, Drawings and sketches. I always do this after pictures with the author, uh, with uh, the one uh, we talk about. I'll, I'll show some graphic works, but related to architecture. So these are sketches, sketches he did for his buildings. And I, I think often these sketches tell, tell the truth of, about someone, because when someone sketches something, and when we sketch something, we usually do it without thinking that someone else will see these sketches. So they are not done with, a, with a, any kind of aesthetical intent. In a, they, they are a, a genuine, a sincere testimony about the workings of our mind. And that's why I, I, I value these sketches and I even value doodles very much. Um, so <laughs> here is the man who said he, he doesn't draw plans, sections and elevations. Can you believe it? But as uh, Luigi Prestinenza, uh, an Italian critic, told me then, never, never trust what uh, architects say. It's kind of true. It was verified to me many times. You know, we, we say one thing and uh, <laughs> do another. So here is the man again who doesn't draw plans, sections, and elevations. Well, <laughs> what else do you see on this page? Even on this one. <laughs> anyway. But uh, I see a certain sensitivity here, and um, you know, uh, you as a thinker, you know, uh, we are talking about a major architect. But as Kenneth Frampton said, Lo Adolf Loss is an enigma, and I think he is an enigma. And I am not going to elucidate this enigma because I don't have yet the tools. Maybe next year or uh, five years from now, if I'm able to talk again about Adolf Loss. I don't know enough about him to be able to say I, I decipher the enigma, no. But I feel there is some kind of an enigma about him. These are, here you see sketches for the house for Tristan Zara, the great uh, Dadaist poet and founder of Dadaist. And you can see in the corner, upper corn, uh, left corner, uh, uh, facade, <laughs> which he didn't draw, uh, which he doesn't draw. And the top part you'll see, because you are we are going to see the building as it was built in Paris. It was built differently uh, a little bit compared to the initial sketches. Please be kind and try to remember that facade. It's not so clearly visible, but anyway, we'll arrive again at that facade. Here is a, an interesting way of, of making a perspectival drawing. Um, and, and, and you can tell that he was an anxious man. I mean, there is a certain darkness about this uh, perspectival sketch, if I am to um, describe it so. Uh, here is a sketch preliminary to his proposal for uh, uh, the Chicago Tribune Tower, the, the, the well-known uh, international competition, which he didn't win but he proposed uh, one of the most uh, so-called outrageous uh, uh, towers. In fact, close to the one on the right, 
But it's interesting here that initially he didn't have a, 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 in his mind a, a Doric column. And the word column was referring to the column of the newspaper because this, was, this tower was, was meant for the Chicago Tribune, that is the headquarters of that newspaper. Uh, but initially, as you can see, it was not a round column, it was a, you know, a square column. Anyway, that's why I think uh, uh, sketches, preliminary sketches are very interesting because you can see the, the initial intuitions of the architect. The, 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 the first gestures usually tell a truth that later on is difficult to, 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 to observe or discover. Uh, yeah, other, for Villa Müller, there are two villas, and we'll see both, the Villa Müller and Villa Müller. <laughs> and it took me some time to, to get accustomed to this. Uh, one is in Vienna, one is in Prague. Um, anyway, so he doesn't draw plans. <laughs> you know, amusing. Now, the first built work by him, the Café Museum on the Karlsplatz Square. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kept very well. And, uh, you know, for all to see is the Café Museum. Uh, and uh, yes, to, to bike in Vienna is a great pleasure. And uh, the students I went with uh, to Vienna for the past three years, uh, except this year, um, enjoyed it very much. It's truly very, very beautiful too except that there are some hills here and there, but otherwise um, it's a very uh, friendly city for bicyclists. Um, well, you know, it's a cafe. I mean, you know, what can you say? You know, you go there to drink a coffee and uh, eat a pastry or something, and maybe, you know, the architecture could be that. I don't know how. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it has virtues, yes. He, he did many interiors. In fact, the last years of his life, uh, apparently he built a lot of interiors in Prague. The problem is information about those, that period in his life uh, is, um, is very poor. I, I couldn't find images. Fortunately, what he built in Austria and in France uh, and in Switzerland, even uh, there is plenty of information. And not about what, what he built in, in Czechoslovakia, because he was actually uh, half Czech. You know, he was, uh, you know, he was not just so-called Austrian. He was Austrian, but he also had uh, some, you know, Czech blood, so to speak. Anyway. Um, yeah, so this was the first, uh, um, you know, major work. That's how it is described in, in, on Wikipedia that was built based on his designs. Now we see a very interesting karma uh, villa, <laughs> a very interesting villa from 1904. So he was 34 years old when he built this opulent, um, aristocratic, large villa in Montreux in Switzerland. And uh, it's a very interesting building. And um, if you want to buy it, uh, it I, I don't know if it's still on sale, but uh, it was on sale very recently. Unfortunately, I don't think it's the least expensive building in the world. Uh, here you see, um, you know, uh, a plan. Very interesting, no? Be with those thick walls, uh, I wonder, maybe he just, amplified an existing building and it just built around it. It seems to be like, kind of like it. Otherwise, you know, why would you have those thick walls behind, you know, a lot of glass? But the entrance into the building is like in a temple, a real temple, Mr. Shigeruban, not like uh, the luminous lantern, um, you know, the beautiful lantern that you built for the Tokyo Park. Uh, also, you will notice here in his plans, he has this peculiarity. One corner, in some other cases, is rounded, but not all of them. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, you know. Um, otherwise, this elevation, for example, is perfectly symmetrical. This one also is almost symmetrical. This is a little bit wider. Uh, 
this is the main entrance and it's truly like in a temple you see it. i like that elevation very much the section is also interesting uh, i i didn't study it sufficiently i feel like studying it now that i look at it again um, and uh, i think we can learn a lot from um, from the plants and sections of the map who doesn't draw plants and sections yeah i think i put it well we can learn a lot from people who uh, we can learn a lot about the plants and sections of people who do not draw plants and sections um, but this is uh, again very interesting uh, because when you look at this building here you almost have the feeling that it should have been the opposite to having the corners kind of opaque you know towers or corners you know kind of like uh, the uh, richard's laboratories by louis khan and here thinner walls but here is the opposite you have transparency and thinner walls towards the corners and towards the outside uh, it's really very interesting. I, I feel like after I end my presentation to spend some time just thinking about these um, plans and sections. So this is the house. We'll have other pictures. Um, it's it's not the most uh, modest house in the world no this is a house for a king or a queen or someone close to you know or a certain bill gates though although i think bill gates will not be happy here because he probably has only one or two or at the most three bathrooms he needed he needs about 27 but i guess he can build them um I wonder how he got this commission, you know, uh, at 34, I mean, he was very young, uh, you know, this is a big uh, house and it's in Switzerland. This is the main facade and uh, <laughs> I, I find it uh, very intriguing, you know, it's uh, almost blank and there are the four Doric columns without a base. Uh, this is interesting. They are cut there but they have a capital but they don't have the base and uh, I, I find it very interesting i think that there was a doric spirit in adolf loss i think he he liked the doric he didn't like the ionic or the corinthian he liked the doric because yes it's normal he didn't like uh, apparent apparently the um, you know the flowerings of uh, ionic or corinthian but uh, even that is questionable and we'll see later why anyway any architect would have built such a building and such a facade with more openings now i'm after all this is the main facade and instead it's almost opaque uh, you know so i understand even from this in relation to this project Frampton's uh, assessment that the Adolf Loss is an enigma is probably appropriate because the so while the main facade the, yes the, the main elevation is almost opaque the back one is full of glass so what does this say about the author you know he is uh, misanthropic towards the you know the the street in a way and uh, uh, you know uh, open and extroverted uh, towards the back well the back in the back there is also a lake it's true but usually you honor the street or the public space with some kind of uh, you know uh, an urban facade this is uh, this probably expresses his asocial side uh but the, the the landscape is glorious i mean uh, you know this is not a house for anybody and and so is the library is beautiful and all the big books are in order there and it's opulent and you know but look at these columns um look at the ornaments of nature look at the ornaments of the marble so this is the man who was against ornaments but he was not against the ornaments of marble and you'll see other examples of this very uh, obvious um, 
Yeah. Lots of books in this house. That's nice. Um, again, here you see the ornaments of nature. Uh, quite expensive, these ornaments, because it's marble. And so, you know, of course, it's very easy for you to say uh, to hell with ornaments. We don't need ornaments. They, are, they represent decadence. We are getting more and more civilized. And on the other hand, use a lot of marble with a lot of uh, its inner and complex and uh, very rich uh, ornamentation. Nice. Who said that life is not nice or could not be nice? I mean. <laughs> not the inhabitants of this house although you know you never know you could you could have madness in this uh, by the way i saw in vienna one evening so vienna is the most comfortable city in the world it was for two years in a row last year and the previous year but i never saw all my life anywhere in the world wherever i went someone screaming so wildly on the street as a lady was coming down a hill while i was walking up the hill in the center of vienna one evening so again, I don't think it's a total accident that psychoanalysis was born in Vienna. Uh, you can uh, get mad even when you are uh, living and owning even this house. Look at that black ceiling, you know. Um, anyway, um, and he uses checkers also. He, here is the man who doesn't use ornaments but he has no problems for using ornamental checkers because what else are they? You know, they are obviously ornamental uh, as they are here. <laughs> so anyway, but an interesting house, a very interesting house. And he assimilated history in a very interesting way. Now, I'm a little bit confused. Maybe you can, uh, you can explain to me what is happening here. Because I have the feeling that these doors, one single door would, would, would be enough. You don't need two considering its width, unless it's a, you know, a distortion because of the, of the perspective. But look at the proportions. I mean, you know, what do you understand here? Because I have a feeling that if you just close one, one door, it would be enough. You don't need the, the second one. The, the, the proportions of the, of, 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 of the doors are, you know, the, the, the width is almost equal to the height. Anyway, maybe it's some kind of a, I don't know, distorted picture or I, I, something I don't understand here. But it's an interesting idea. Because you give, let's say, you can use just one door would be enough to close the opening, uh, to shut off the opening of the, of the door. But, uh, and you have two options, to use the left one or the right one. Uh, I don't know if this is the case, but it looks like that if you bring both of them towards the opening, uh, they will overlap because they are too wide. Anyway. Now, this is the view, <laughs> the less misanthropic uh, elevation, the one towards the glory of the lake. Uh, and yes, it is beautiful. What else can we say? Now, an American bar uh, on Kardner Strasse from 1904. So he uh, was again 19, uh, was, uh, was 34 years old. Uh, he did a lot of interiors. And um, I don't know exactly why it is called the American bar, but it is. I don't know if it was, but it is uh, now. And uh, again, the checkered, um, you know, floor. Uh, and uh, again, you know, would you call this a, a small building without ornaments? Come on, I mean. You know the, the the ornaments of the of the pillars. They are almost uh, Jugendstil. You know, almost Art Nouveau. Uh, they are 
they would have provoked the envy of Gustav Klimt. <laughs> yes. And inside too, it's quite busy, ornamentally speaking. <laughs> anyway, it's also busy with the ornamentation of the many kinds of salt and you know the other you know, ingredients they have. Uh, anyway, it's about. Now we arrive at a very important building by him, the Steiner House from 1910. So he was 40 years old, uh, and um, it's it's a little house. Now is uh, I have been there with the students, and uh, we couldn't get in. It's some kind of uh, I think uh, I forgot you know an organization or anyway it's private. You cannot get in. Uh, it's it appears. As, as as being a smaller house towards the you know the street, but if you look from the side, you see that it's not so small, uh, and it actually it has four floors uh, with a basement. I, I don't know about the fence, but maybe he didn't do the fence. That the fence is you know quite uh, domestic and uh, you know traditionalist. But you can tell on many of, well, on many, on some of his buildings, the facade, the main facade has a, a certain uh, anthropocentric or anthropomorphic quality. It's almost see the face, a human face with two eyes and the nose and the mouth. Um, well, here there are three eyes, but <laughs> in other cases you'll see, um, there is almost like a human effigy uh, face. And there is an interesting space here. We'll have a picture also from the inside. You know, it's, it's kind of a space uh, without a uh, prescribed function maybe, but uh, it's, uh, it's nice. You see this picture here. Uh, I didn't find another one, but sorry for the resolution. Uh, Villa Steiner. Um, no, he was a master of uh, domestic architecture. I, I think he, uh, and so very different, for example, from, uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, he was American, but, um, and by the way of this, um, um, Adolf Loss uh, was was very impressed by America. He traveled young there and was influenced by America. He came back to Europe, uh, you know, uh, willing to, to convince the Europeans to get rid of the uh, frivolous, uh, you know, ornaments and all kinds of historical references to free architecture and life from the uh, in positions. But his architecture is European and is urban, very different from the architecture of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. He doesn't aspire towards a distant horizon. He doesn't have the building extended, uh, extending ad infinitum horizontally or vertically for that matter. He, I think he's uh, the arch, the, the, the the quintessential architect of uh, some kind of a mixture between the bourgeois and a certain kind of aristocracy. I, I wouldn't say that his architecture is destined for the proletarians. He doesn't have, although he was probably not arrogant towards those, you know, less privileged, but he built for the privileged. I don't know if he's, uh, there is only one, a little bit smaller house, but uh, even that house is, um, is not for a, for a proletarian, for a blue collar worker, no. As opposed to the, to the students of, uh, of um, Otto Wagner, who, you know, used their talent uh, for years to build the Red Vienna, to build, you know, social housing. No, uh, the, 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 there are there aren't such uh, projects uh, in uh, in uh, Adolf Loss uh, ever. You can tell, you know, this this living room is not for for a for a blue collar worker. It's not for a proletarian. I, I don't think he had communistic uh, longings.
I'm not a great analyst, but I hope you are, and I invite you to, to contemplate some of his houses and, and, and look more carefully at the plans, at the sections of the men who didn't draw them. Because I think there are uh, discoveries to be made there and probably important ones. I know that some schools of architecture study his buildings very carefully. I mean, the students as assignments. He also designed furniture and at the end of the presentation, you will see uh, some of, 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 of the, the furnitures that he, he designed. So this is, you know, a computerized uh, drawing of the Steiner house. Uh, you know, kind of naively represented, but uh, to an extent maybe accurately. Sometimes I see in his building his face. I think uh, many times our buildings are, uh, you know, um, autobiographical. Uh, even uh, in terms of um, visuality. Look at the openings, you know, look in this section, look at the door, look at the windows. You know, they are, he doesn't use the windows, you know, uh, dogmatically promoted by Le Corbusier. These are, these are almost traditional. So you, you would understand perhaps why he would say, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't be afraid to be unfashionable. So in a, a paradoxical, maybe typically Viennese way, he, he advocates an architecture that is forward looking, but also using so-called unfashionable uh, elements. I mean, he is anchored at, at that time in 1910, there was still an emperor there. So, you know, uh, uh, the war ended in 1918, uh, the empire fell, but not in 1910. So there was still, uh, you know, Vienna was, was the capital of an empire. There was an emperor. And this, I think, uh, adds somehow to the complexity of the cultural context in which he lived and worked. Now, the famous Lost House, um, as it is called now, initially was also built in 1910 when he was 40. Goldman and Salach building overlooking Mikhail, uh, Mikhailer's Platz in Vienna, a mixed use building known colloquial, uh, co colloquially as the Lost House in one world. It's well known, you know it. Um, it's, uh, it's a building that initially uh, outraged, uh, you know, the Viennese, the conformists, but um, now everybody is accepting it as an inevitable uh, you know, building in, in Vienna. Now, if you look at the building on the left and you look at the building on the right, meaning his building, the only you know, distant similarity is that you know, for two floors or one floor and a half or two floors, there is some kind of ornamentation and complexity. But from here upwards, it's totally different from this building, from here upwards. So for two floors here, you can still see some kind of, um, not historicism, but the, you know, the complication of the, in aesthetical terms, caused by the complexities of marble, because that's about it. It's the marble that makes um, in the building until that level, you know, kind of acceptable for, for the one who wants more than just blank, blankness or blankness. So it, it's, it, it's a good building, but you'll see that, uh, and with the beautiful plants, I mean, this is a perfect plan in terms of composition, you know, now maybe he didn't draw it himself, but he created it, obviously, and uh, <laughs> you know, even if he didn't draw plans, 
this drone plan is 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 is, is very sensitive and very beautiful. I think. Um, nothing wrong with this plan. Now, this is the man who wrote uh, violently almost against ornament. Can you believe it? No. <laughs> he was actually uh, intensely ornamental. In, uh, look at these details. But yes, this is, this, these were the ornaments of nature. That is the only difference. I think there was a schism in him, and you know what I mean by schism, that he was a dual man, that, 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 that there was a, like uh, uh, Goethe said in, uh, in Faust, alas, two souls are dwelling in my heart. Well, I see this here too, you know, in, uh, the, the, you know this part of the building and this part of the building, they, uh, they, they are almost uh, disjuncted, and and he's the same man, but I think there was a double in him. The interior is also very nice. I, to my shame, I never entered there, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, a, you know, a, it's a building that, uh, <laughs> you know, tells you, you know, this, this is not for everybody. You know, it's, it's. Uh, there is a richness there. There is a feeling of uh, aristocratic uh, you know, expectations. You can tell. Anyway, um, and the windows again are uh, different than the, wing, the, the ubiquitous uh, windows of modernity because they are divided into small squares. So it's a different kind of feeling. And I, I, I personally like it. I like these, these fragmented windows. Now, of course, there is a bank there now because, or there was a bank. Uh, banks always buy the, the most prestigious uh, buildings. Now you see in these cartoons, you know, the reference to the, <laughs> To the lost house, and the bourgeois looks in, into the you know, that uh, opening for the canal, and uh, you know, <laughs> this is what a malicious cartoonist um, had to say about the building. Okay, now uh, another house from 1912, 1913. This is a house I came across accidentally with some students. I didn't know that this house was by him, but when I saw it, I, I told the students, this must be by Adolf Loss. And then we checked on the, on the, uh, the mobile phones and indeed it, it is by him. It was by him and it is by him. It's a smaller house, it's not so, you know, well known, but uh, it, it's him, it's Adolf Loss. And look at this back facade with those uh, diagonals on the, you know, why did he do, the, why did he need to do that? That is to me on, on a, a form of ornamentation. And this is the main facade. When I visited, well, I, when it happened that I, searching for something else, I came across this uh, it, I, we couldn't see it because of the trees. Uh, it was the summer, and so they were, there was a lot of green. It's a little house, but yes, it's Adolf Loss. There were some influences, and I don't have here materials to show it, but in Japan, Adolf Loss had a, a big impact uh, on some architects. I think even Arata Isozaki, who got the Pritzker Prize last year, uh, was influenced by Adolf Loss. 
uh, usually, uh, you know, architects from other parts of the world, uh, when they look towards Europe, they get inspiration from Palladio and coming closer to us, uh, here comes uh, Adolf Loss. Now another house from 1913. Uh, I don't know, I don't know German, so I don't know how to pronounce that short name. So, so, so I don't know. Um, again, this is by the man who doesn't draw plans and sections. Um, incredible. Well, in a way, you say, isn't it uh, sad that he doesn't use that attic? It doesn't seem to be used, I mean, but, you know, uh, the form itself maybe would have been an invitation to do something there, like in the house by Frank Lloyd Wright that he built for himself in Oak Park uh, near Chicago. Anyway, but you see, he's not dogmatic in his plans, you know, he's... Uh, he did. He does like the round in one corner, you know, uh, either stair or uh, something. He is attracted by a by a cylinder somehow in one corner of the building, and only one. Interesting. Uh, this is something worth uh, maybe um, studying a little bit. Otherwise, the house, uh, you know, seen from the outside is, um, yeah. You could almost say Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein is not far away, the great philosopher who built a, a famous house for his sister. So now he is considered also a great architect because of that villa. Ludwig Wittgenstein, I, I suggest to you to search for his uh, name on, uh, on Google uh, images and uh, you'll see lots of pictures. Uh, yeah. It's a good house. It's, uh, you know, it's modern. It's very different from that uh, government building uh, in India that we saw at the beginning. But uh, it's not bad. And it's not bad even when covered with ivy. I keep telling the students, you know, if the elevation doesn't uh, succeed uh, in terms of accomplishment, just allow the ivy to attack the building and it will be fine. I didn't yet see an ugly building that was covered with ivy. Now, an ivy, ivy makes a beautiful building of any building. Doesn't matter how unresolved in terms of its aesthetics. Okay, so this is another building and we'll arrive soon at the building in Paris for Tristan Tsara. Here also there are complexities. This is what I actually love and I really didn't analyze them as I should have. But um, I think his plans are uh, worth, uh, worth uh, studying. And his sections, <laughs> considering he doesn't draw sections either. OK, um, we saw this one. We saw the building from the outside. Again, the windows are uh, specific to him in a way. You know? Although also uh, Joseph Hoffman used such windows, you know, fragmented windows in little squares. Um, so the outline of the building is um, robust. But then it, it, the, these windows uh, bring in a certain uh, impressionistic quality almost that uh, uh, gives some sensitivity to, to the robust configuration of the volumes and the mass. This is a remodel. I only have two or three pictures of it from 1915, 1916. But he also designed two little chairs for this villa, which you'll see at the end. Again, we are dealing with an architect who rejected violently ornament. <laughs> it's incredible. In fact, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to find a, a room more ornamental than this one. Again, because of the marble. I mean, uh, you know, he spent a lot of money on these walls because marble is uh, not the least expensive material in the world.
yeah, he remodeled. It was an existing house, so you know he couldn't do too much here. Okay, now a mausoleum for Max Max, Max Polzak, the great uh, composer. Uh, it was not built, but uh, it was built uh, recently, I think, in England, and uh, and uh, also it had an influence on the Japanese architect. And unfortunately, I don't have here images with uh, what the Japanese architect did, and I should have, but I kept postponing, and now it's too late. This is uh, there are books also mentioning this project by him. This was supposed to be the mausoleum. And uh, as I said, it was not built, but uh, and here is a, you know, a sketch in a way of you know, the, the, you know, the plan section and uh, the elevation and the new, uh, small perspective. Uh, it's a primal archetypal little structure. And this person, Sam Jacob, I think he's a sculptor, erects, erected an Adolf Loss Design Museum mausoleum in Highgate, in the Highgate Cemetery, which is this one, and which was based, you know, on, on uh, Adolf Loh's uh, uh, scheme, but, you know, it was built recently, this one. And also this one is built with different materials, as you can see, it's uh, transparent. And it's not a toilet, it's not, it might be a luminous uh, lantern, but it's not, a, it's not a toilet in the Tokyo Park. Now, the Ruffer House from 1922 in Vienna. Um, somebody, some Italians uh, made these drawings and uh, again, they deserve uh, attention. And uh, I, unfortunately, uh, I'm not yet a great analyst, but I should become. Maybe next year I, I can explain more in detail what is going on here. But my first impression is that these houses um, uh, have a lot to offer if they begin to be analyzed and uh, understood. Because I feel there are complexities that work that are, uh, could be quite, uh, to use a non-academic word, uh, delicious. Otherwise, uh, outside the building is, <laughs> It's anything but delicious. It's, uh, you know, it's a <clears throat> discouragingly cubical uh, building, uh, you know. Uh, but you see the face that I was telling you about, the two eyes and the kind of the mouth. I mean, there is something very often in his buildings that they are almost uh, approximation somehow of, of a human face. This is, I. I, I wonder if he did something, I, 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 I imagine he didn't. Maybe someone else afterwards did his base relief because this was against his principles, you know. So, uh, although in, in Vienna, uh, there are many buildings where there are such cultural interventions on either, otherwise plain facades. This is also an interesting drawing because it shows the openings in the walls and uh, you know the facade we just saw is here but they are all very interesting and maybe this is a uh, possible can be used as a strategy to design facades where you have a simple outline and that's just the black whatever it is opening uh, to be represented in this way and you you can you can see clearly where the openings are because they are black I wonder if he used any system here because they seem to be, you know, kind of uh, at random somehow. But maybe they are not so at random as they, they might appear to be. I don't know. But I, I find this, uh, this drawing uh, stimulating, although it is a simple drawing, uh, almost a sketch. But I, uh, I feel it tells something about his architecture. Maybe something important. Uh, a model, also the way he plays with the stairs, you know, and I saw this before with different angles, you know, he doesn't use, like most architects, stairs with the same um, angle, you know, is uh, here you, you can see clearly that, and this is also interesting.
If I am to put it simplistically, perhaps I would say he's a cubist, at least in his, not just in his um, domestic, uh, you know, his houses, uh, and, and, and he breaks the cubes with these uh, rather traditional openings, you know. Uh, it's as if he takes the windows from other architectures and other buildings, and then, then he breaks the cubes that he creates. But it's more complex because he doesn't design from the outside towards the inside, but probably from the inside towards the outside, although the outside seems to be containing the inside in a you know, in an almost restrictive way because of this cubistic uh, configuration. I, I think that when I look at these drawings, I kind of understand what he meant when he said that he doesn't work with plans, sections, and elevations. In other words, he he, he feels the, the 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 interior substance of the building, the essence of the building, the reality of the building, in three dimensions, and and he doesn't work. It's almost as if the plans, sections, and uh, elevations are a result of something else. Um, I don't know if I explained well. I have to reflect more about this, but I see a certain complexity here, you know, and the exterior seems to be almost banal and very simple and almost simplistic, but the inside is a different story. Okay, now Maison Tsara, which means the Tristan Tsara house. Now the story is like this, because Tristan Tsara was born in Romania, in Moldavia, and I always wonder how come someone born in a village in Moldavia had the money to, to commission Adolf Loss to build a big house for himself in Paris, in Mont Mont Montmartre. <laughs> And I learned what the story was. Well, it wasn't his money. It was the money of his wife, um, a Swedish uh, lady. And uh, <laughs> so it's interesting that he didn't invest the money, his wife's money, into a Dadaist architect. And in fact, his very friend, Marcel Yanko, uh, also Romanian and also a founder of the Dadaist movement, was an architect and he could have built it. He instead commissioned Adolf Loss, who was not a Dadaist. So there are contradictions here. You have a poet who was an avant garde poet, uh, Dadaist through and through. He even wrote the, the manifesto of Dadaist, which I uh, suggest to you if you want to read, you can find it on the web. Commission Adolf Loss of all people to build his home, his house in Paris in 1925, two years or three years before Villa Savoie was built by Le Corbusier. But at that time, Le Corbusier was, uh, was, uh, you know, was there in Paris. He had his office there, was struggling, and anyway. This is the, the facade, the, the main elevation of the building, the house of Tristan Tsara by Adolf Loss, but was not built as he wanted it to be built. He wanted this line to be much higher. So it would have been, the, the, the top part of the building would have been higher. You will see. Uh, so I don't know exactly why it was be like this, but you see a peculiarity of, the, of Adolf Loss already on the main facade. And that is the, the main facades are uh, often kind of opaque, like in this one, a lot of blank wall. And then these small windows. I mean, look, these are doors here. I mean, this is quite tall here. You know, if, if, uh, if uh, uh, you know, uh, a door is, let's say, two meters and 10 centimeters or so, you know, then you have here other, you know, uh, five, six meters almost above the top of the, 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 the doors. So it's very interesting. 
also he uses here different materials you see he is not in in the buildings in vienna you don't see uh, you know stone or brick or, or organic materials uh, as you see here in this house uh, it's uh, i have been there actually it's not so big as uh, you might expect uh, not so monumental or it didn't appear uh, to me when i was there uh, the interior also has traditional elements and I imagine, I mean, maybe he didn't choose the furniture himself, but uh, you see in his interiors, traditional pieces of furniture, you don't see actually modern, still tubular, in fact, you know, uh, the chair, Kandinsky chair by Marcel Breuer was already done. Uh, there were pieces of furniture already, you know, modern furniture on the market. Now, in the interiors of Adolf Loos, you see very traditional pieces of furniture, both in his house and in uh, other houses that he built. I mean, you know, uh, this uh, this uh, table and you know even a bench in front of the table and whatever else is there could have adorned also a Victorian building and maybe even a medieval building. It's a good building. It's a good building and uh, I'm happy that the Swedish uh, wife of Tristan Tsara afforded it. And I, I, you can only envy, you know, a poet who is doing so well to have such a house built in Montmartre because I, 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 I never imagined that the Dadaist poet would, would be able to, and he was probably the only one who afforded such a luxury. Usually poets live in the gutter almost, you know, they, they don't have opulent houses designed by, you know, famous architects. Anyway, I look at it, you know, it has several floors, you know, in fact, five floors, Jesus, you know, uh, Yes. And, it's interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, then, because this strikes me uh, with the face of Adolf Loos and the face of Tristan Sara. I mean, uh, it, I just never seen anyone draw, uh, you know, uh, uh, an elevation and a section with the face of the client and his own face. Well. Uh... Sorry, I, I didn't understand. I, I, I don't think this drawing I was not done by him. This oh, was, I see. Yeah, this was done by someone afterwards. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> Tristan Sara was doing well, uh, as you can tell. Um, Dada is most very interesting, and I think one day perhaps we should have a gathering to talk about architecture and Dada is. Maybe you received already my invitation for two days from now on the 25th, Zaratustra and architecture. This was a um, risk taking from my part. Uh, I invited also a lot of Harvard professors, but they, of course they will not show up. But I, I still think the subject uh, could be very interesting unless I am uh, losing my mind, which is also very possible. Anyway, um, also, if any of you would like to propose a theme for a discussion or a presentation or both, let's do it, because there are many interesting themes that need to be, uh, need to be addressed, yes. This one with the Zarathustra and architecture, I thought of because it will be on the day when uh, Friedrich Nietzsche died in 1900. So there will be 120 years since Friedrich Nietzsche died. And uh, I, I almost feel like uh, opposing uh, the beautiful lantern in the Tokyo Park uh, to Zarathustra, because I really think we have very low um, preoccupations. I'm sorry, but I think human beings are, there was a very important uh, Romanian architect, an aristocrat actually, trained in Paris, but a very subtle and complex spirit. And he said something that I believe is true. He said, the architect serves man and his gods. 
And I think the second part, meaning his gods, is totally absent in our world. You know, we only think of men and men and men. And if we transform, so uh, again, what did Kantakuzi know? That was his name mean when he said um, the architect uh, is, uh, is serving uh, uh, men and his gods. But who are these gods? You know, because today our gods seem to be connected with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, peeing and pooing. I mean, we don't believe any longer in gods. The people who built Borobudur did believe in gods, but we don't. So it's a godless world. And so who are our gods? Maybe the refrigerator, maybe the TV, maybe the soccer game. Who are our gods? And I think it's important to think about something that is outside of the human being that needs not to be forgotten. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, our gods are very, very prosaic and very banal, and they depress me beyond measure. I would love to do a building, let's say, that celebrates, um, you know, maybe yes, a particular human being and uh, an abstract, uh, you know, notion like friendship or love or uh, what if we build a house of the wind or the house of love, as I said, or the house of, uh, I don't know, uh, even betrayal. How would be the house of betrayal? You know, how would be the house of uh, avarice, the house of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hypochondria or the house of, I mean, there are so many aspects of life that we totally neglect and they could be expressed psychologically in the buildings, you know, I think. Anyway, but I, I, I do believe that the metaphysical side of architecture is very, very important and is almost totally neglected today. And if we try to transform toilets in some kind of metaphysical statements, I think we are on the wrong path. I'm sorry about it, but uh, you know, uh, anyway, we can talk about this architecture and metaphysics. I, I think it's important to talk about it. You see here in the elevation, that's how he proposed it, but that's not how it was built. It was, you know, the building ended somewhere here. Anyway, um, quite a worked out uh, little drawing. Well, it wasn't so little, but uh, you see a lot of calculations and a lot of, uh, I wonder if these were his working drawings, you know. Um, this would be unacceptable today, you know, nobody would give you the right to build on such, you know, disorderly and uh, imperfect drawings. No, they have to be, God, frighteningly perfect. Anyway. So this is the house of Tristan Zara, the Dadaist founder, one of the four Dadaist founders uh, and the one who wrote the manifesto. Now the Müller Villa uh, in Vienna from 1926, also a very important building and I like very much this uh, front elevation. Uh, it's truly like an architectonic face. Um, I don't usually like faces, that's why I don't even like Facebook and I don't use it exactly because the word face refers to bidimensionality, it's not three dimensionality, not to speak about uh, more dimensions, it's just an appearance, uh, a face and that's what Facebook is about, it's about appearances, it's not about depth, it's not a depth connection with someone else, it's just at the level of uh, titillation, you know, just, uh, you know, my cat gave birth to the 11 kitten and then uh, the other one tells you that, you know, just got married and some happy pictures and uh, of course we'll neglect deadly and dreary pictures with Hiroshima. It's all about, you know, uh, kind of a, go, a happy go lucky life. It's all a fascia, you know, Potemkin, uh, Potemkin uh, facades. You know, meaning fake, actually, to an extent. In this case, it's also kind of a mask, but, and there is a building by Le Corbusier, and you are going to see it in Paris, very, very similar to this building. In fact, you wonder who made it first. Um, but I, I like this facade very much. It's perfect, you know, it's a square, it's perfectly symmetrical, 
but it's also enigmatic somehow. Maybe what he wanted to say is here it is a mask, the mask of a, of a complex, more or less complex building. And I'm not going to tell you what is behind it. It's, it's, uh, I'm letting you imagine at the most. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, I'm not betraying my inner life to the street. It's interesting, again, to use small windows towards the street, you know, very small. I mean, you know, uh, what is this? You know, it's like uh, 60 centimeters by or 80 centimeters by 80 at the most. Uh, very interesting uh, facade. I like it. I, it's, I mean, you know, symmetry can be disturbing sometimes, but somehow he is convincing with symmetry and so was Le Corbusier. Um, this is one, in, in my opinion, one of his best buildings. Particularly because of the front facade, which is a mask. Behind it, as you can tell, it's a, it's a different story. It's a, it's a different uh, building, almost. You, know? you, you wouldn't expect, you would expect a cube, but instead, the longitudinal um, section shows a building of some complexity. So what we see here is the street, and we see the blank wall at the top, you know, saying to you, I'm a knight, I have an armor, I am not going to allow you to enter, uh, except through some very small openings, and that is because I'm a generous knight, otherwise I would make everything blank. But how different he is on the other side. This is opening up with a balcony, with loggia, with lots of glass. Look at this one and look at here. But this is towards the other side, the private one. And he builds these, uh, you know, the furniture is built into the walls and it's, uh, he creates various levels. I think he's very skillful at this. Uh, the building here is not kept very well, but uh, is maybe in the process of, uh, and is not inhabited, obviously. But uh, another interesting building by uh, Adolf Loss. Well, here we do see some quotations, I mean, not quotations, but, um, you know, dimensions and the dimensioning. Timmer, 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 there are a good number of, of, of rooms. Now, we see the building by Le Corbusier and Pierre Jandre, his cousin, Maison Planex, which is almost identical with the building that, uh, that Adolf Loss did. And here you see the two interposed. This is by Le Corbusier, and this is, you know, uh, the, from, from the diagonal uh, towards the right lower corner is uh, Adolf Loss. But I had to think a little bit because, you know, it could have been the other way around. They are almost identical. And uh, let's see when he built this. 1927. So actually, no, no. Loss. No, no. So Le Corbusier built in 1925-1928 and uh, Adolf Loss built Villa Müller between 1927 and 1928. They were almost, uh, they were built sim almost simultaneously. Okay, now a house built for the American entertainer, Josephine Baker. Now, Josephine Baker was a dancer of extreme talent and a great seducer. She seduced Le Corbusier, who almost melted uh, in front of her, and so did uh, Adolf Loss, who immediately proposed to her to design for, for free, meaning no commission, no money involved, you know, just love work, a uh, uh, project for the, in Paris, a house. And you will see it now. And you'll also see pictures of Josephine Baker, who took Paris by storm, uh, uh, together with uh, Le Corbusier, wearing <laughs> white shoes on a, on, a, on a boat, carrying them from the United States to Europe. But again, we are in 1927 in Paris, and Adolf Loss, in his extreme generosity and his extreme interest in women, designing for, <laughs> for this great, truly great American uh, 
called entertainer, a dancer, but an intelligent woman, and a complex woman, who in the end settled for buying a castle for herself in France and forgot about the project done so benevolently by uh, by the um, by Adolf Loss. So this was the site for the project, uh, and um, you'll see the project here in a perspective done probably after uh, the death of Adolf Loss, more recently a digital rendering. Uh, you see the plants, but we'll, again we see one corner that is rounded. But what this house has, uh, you know, a peculiarity, it has a, a swimming pool within the building. It's here, and uh, so I imagine Adolf Loss was imagining himself, you know, uh, walking around the sw inner swimming pool and contemplating Josephine Baker swimming within the room. Um, so this is the sous-sol, meaning the, the, the basement, uh, you know, uh, he, he even has a cave, a cave, some kind of a cave. By the way, a bit, uh, I invite you in a few days to talk about the cave revival or architecture and prehistory. This is another theme that interests me. And because I see some kind of a, an interest in, and it became almost a passion, the cave in today's architecture. Uh, Arata Isozaki did it, Ishigami did it, uh, you know, uh, what's her name, uh, Ginny Gang uh, did it, and um, so there are, uh, even Doshi did it, so there are some very important architects who worked towards some kind of a cave revival, as amusingly a doctoral student named it, the cave revival. I think it sounds funny. Uh, and this is the first floor, you see, you have everything there, you know, many rooms and stairs. And here you have, you see law, meaning water. This was supposed to be the swimming, uh, um, you know, place or room within, within the house. And uh, of course the ubiquitous uh, round cylinder the corner, as we learned that is a patient with, uh, with Adolf Loss, and the big salon, and uh, you know, I can only think of uh, the animated Adolf Loss designing for free this uh, this house. Uh, this is what love does. What can you do? Uh, you see the PC, meaning the the swimming pool. Interesting, but these again they deserve a little bit of study. You see them all together here. And, uh, and uh, we have another one with a section. Uh, I have a feeling that a student of architecture, if, if, if he or she has a little bit of patience, can, can learn architecture from this gentleman, at least at the level of you know, private residences, by studying some of his plans and sections, since it's not so rare to find an architect who doesn't draw plans and sections. As I said before, I repeat myself, sorry. So, um, yeah, this was the house. Here there are some uh, digital renderings done after, you know, uh, he passed away, of course, uh, recently. People try to imagine how this house would have been. Uh, this is not a great resolution, but it's the only picture I found. And another image from the outside, which you saw already. And I don't know if this is Adolf Loss here. Uh, he loved hats, but uh, this doesn't quite look like the kind of hats he liked. Uh, a little bit too bohemian, bohemian. He was not really a bohemian. He was very elegant most of the time. Okay, so the house of love for Josephine Baker. And now you'll see, do you know these two people taking part in a carnival? Now these two people are on the left, uh, Le Corbusier, and on the right, Josephine Baker, on a, on a ship bringing them, I'm not very sure, I think from the United States to Europe, or the other way around. Anyway, they were on a ship, and uh, you see here there is someone else also, uh, you know, wearing a costume. And, uh, and here you see again, uh, 
uh, you know, the great modern architect Le Corbusier with uh, strangely light, uh, you know, I don't know about people with white shoes, but they seem to be almost white and smoking incessantly because he was falling in love himself. And in fact, there are, he also, uh, there are drawings, you can find them on the, on the, on the web, or at least one drawing kind of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit uh, sensuous, uh, sensual, if not downright erotical, with Josephine Baker. He drew her. She was probably a, a fascinating uh, woman. I mean, not probably, surely, because uh, <laughs> otherwise uh, the Corbusier wouldn't smoke so much in her proximity. But all the other gentlemen have a certain uh, facial expression that shows, uh, uh, you know, uh, agitation to an extent. Anyway, so. Uh, the famous Villa Müller, but in Prague, so not to be confounded with Villa Müller. This is in Prague, and it's the typical, the paradigmatic, um, misleading uh, Lossian cube. I say misleading because the uh, longitudinal section shows that the building is more than a cube. And uh, yeah. Uh, by now, we, we kind of know how uh, Adolf Loss building uh, looks like. A lot of opacity, especially at the top part. And uh, the, um, I don't know how to call them. They probably have a more, uh, uh, more uh, accurate uh, name, these, these windows. I call them traditional windows, but it's probably not the correct way to put it. Anyway, the interiors are um, uh, very, very uh, convincing. I, I think, because there are these, uh, you know, this could have been easily a maybe well-proportioned room and just that, but it's more than a room exactly because how the, 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 the inner space opens up here towards the interior, towards the center, and becomes fragmented and sculptural and interesting and inviting and mysterious. I think he's very good at this. Look, even this, uh, you know, on one side, the room becomes something else, becomes part of, uh, of the public life of the private residence, if I, can, if I can say so. So the stair is not fractured from the room, it takes part in, to the room, it belongs to the room and also belongs to the spaces outside of the room. Um, and again, the marble, of course, it has to be. And uh, you know, thanks to the Italians, we have uh, we have these drawings. I can I can send you the PowerPoint presentation and even the recording if I didn't forget again to uh, activate the recording. Um, it, it, it's a good building. It's a good building which still needs to be discovered. Lots of pieces of furniture. It's, it's a big building. It's not, uh, you know, again, it's not for a proletarian. He didn't build for proletarians. But you see how integra he integrates the furniture, you know, a built in bed, and, you know, you have this uh, robust uh, usage of the wood, and uh, it's both warm and a little bit uh, austere. But the wood is warm, but the geometry is austere. So there is some kind of a conjunction of the opposites, which, which I think is, uh, is good. Other variations of the plan. And again, this interstitial space, which I think is a trademark for him, you know, where again, the, the vertical circulation takes place in steps, in, uh, is fragmented and it unites various floors without separating them brutally. And uh, this is interesting, I think. Look, this is a very, it's an excellent, uh, uh, almost a quintessential image for uh, Adolf Loos, for his domestic architecture. The way he viscerally, but geometrically as well, opens up the interior and it becomes symphonic somehow. Now another villa from uh, Kreuzberg in Austria, 1929. We are approaching actually the end of his career and the end of his life. Unfortunately, this is not a house 
per se, maybe it was initially, but now is a, you know, kind of a motel or hotel. It's a large Alpine, uh, you know, structure uh, in the mountains. So you see it here. It's, it's, uh, it's a place where you can rent a room and whatever, if you go skiing, it's not the typical Adolf loss. Uh, maybe it was even finalized after his death, I don't know. And you can tell, you know, it, it can accommodate many people. It has a restaurant and so on. All, you know, kind of high class, and very well kept, very civilized. But in this picture, you can approximate that maybe at one time it was just for a family, it was a villa. Again, the, the built-in uh, furniture and uh, the, like the beds. And I'm thinking of the Japanese. And I think for these times as ours, uh, I saw in Japanese traditional houses, they, they don't have furniture. You know, they have these alcoves. They, they have these closets where they could also sleep. And I think it could, it could, it could work. It, it works for Japan. Why couldn't, why, why couldn't they work for us? And you save space and, uh, you know, uh, the room is free from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a big bed, you know, and now it's intimate. Even a larger bed, I don't know. It's interesting, I think, to have a bed in a closet, you know. You return to the womb, to the maternal womb, architectonically represented by the dark closet. Okay, so enough with uh, domesticity in the public real, because that's how I, I put it here. And then I think we very soon we go to, ah, there is another villa in, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic. The typical, uh, uh, but not so typical. This one is a little bit different uh, than other works. It is Adolf Loss, but somehow the windows are bigger. There is a little more transparency, maybe because he was uh, nostalgic towards his uh, native land. Um, it's a little bit different, but it's still adult loss. Generous rooms, but again, big windows, a uh, lot of light. This is also not for a proletarian. Now you wonder what is going on here, you know, in all this, they occupy a big space, but what is happening here? It's, I have to see from the other side, but I can. Anyway, uh, interesting ar architectonic uh, configurations here, and he's very good at this. Just like in the previous villa, you see he opens up on one side, uh, towards something else, which is only par partially disclosing itself, that space that, of course, if you live there, you know what is going on, but uh, it, it's, it's still a, that transitional space, I think is almost essential for his houses. The checkers, no ornaments, but yes, ornaments, a little bit. A good, uh, good uh, staircase, uh, and interestingly colored. I don't know if these were his original, uh, if this was his original proposal. Now, if these were his uh, working drawings, uh, you know, I envy him because they are done so almost casually, although precisely, but. Uh, you know, kind of in a casual way, in terms of drawing, how the drawing is done, without using templates, and now without using the myriad of opportunities that we have, thanks to softwares. They seem cozy and also a little bit monumental at the same time. Interesting mixture. Because it's difficult to bring monumentality in the proximity of coziness. But he seems to be able to. 
And now we see his project for the Chicago Tribune Tower from 1922, uh, a very important uh, competition that was won by an architect who proposed a neo-Gothic tower, so all the modernists were left behind. This was the project uh, he proposed, uh, the Dory column sustaining the sky, but I read that uh, it was a reference to the column in a newspaper, because newspapers use columns, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, writing. And, uh, but I don't know, maybe there is more to it here. You could even say it's a metaphor for the power of a newspaper, meaning the media is, 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 is the central pillar in today's life because it controls everything through its power. And in a way, it, it even sustains the sky itself if I'm allowed to make an extravagant statement. This, uh, this is a digital, uh, you, you can find on the web even a, a, a short video. You know, they, you know, they, uh, they made a video with this tower, which was never built. Probably in my opinion, it would have been a little bigger than what we see here. Uh, at least this is uh, his project seems to be bigger than what was uh, shown there. And uh, here you see four projects from that competition. I only know the one who was done. The architect who did the one on the left, and then we recognize Adolf Loss, and then the one on the right was Bruno Taut. I don't know who did the second one from the left, but the first one on the left is Walter Gropius, then the unknown one. If you have good eyes and I don't, maybe you can read it's written there. And then uh, you have Adolf Loss and then uh, Bruno Taut. Interesting, the tower by Bruno Taut, I, I would say. And this is the, <laughs> it's a funny and naive plan, you know, from, for, from one of the great architects of the 20th century. Look at the plan, the one on the left, and he just writes there on a little room, pipes. <laughs> You know, if it would be so easy, you know, it would be so nice. I mean, if a student would do something like this today in a school, uh, the, 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 would, would fail the project. But here, you know, you have one of the paradigmatic architects of the 20th century, just writing, you know, maybe with a free hand, uh, you know, pipes. <laughs> you know, because yes, the building had to have some pipes too. Funny. <laughs> Yeah, but architects usually don't like pipes. In fact, uh, Louis Kahn hated them, and uh, that's why he encased them in those uh, brick towers that are uh, inspired by the towers in San Gimignano. I'm talking about the Richards Laboratories. He even said that if we don't encase the pipe, the pipes, they will take over the building, and we don't want that. So he tried to imprison them in very, very strong. Uh, medieval towers almost. Anyway, here we see, of course, comparison. I'm not sure Adolf Loss was so academic about it. Anyway, um, although you saw, he did use uh, Dory columns in a uh, few occasions. And then, of course, with digital uh, renderings, we, well, lots of uh, analysis were made. and. Uh, not quite correct because the, the drawing he made shows a little curvature in the, in, the, in the section. I don't quite see it, but maybe I don't see well. Anyway, this is the elevation of the building. Maybe Aldo Rossi would have liked it. Uh, and other people liked it. It would have been a powerful presence in, in the, the architectural landscape of Chicago. This is the tower that won. This is the tower that was built, the neo-Gothic. <laughs> of course, you know, because Chicago missed Europe. Chicago missed the history of Europe and they didn't want, but, but they didn't want an abstractive version of that history like Adolf Lawson or even Bruno Tau. They wanted the real thing, if we can call it so. The neo-Gothic became real in Chicago because they missed history, they missed so-called culture. So they imported, it's, it's not a bad building, but it's, it's telling a lie in a way, because we are talking about the 20th century. And anyway, 
So this was built, this one, and this one was not built and didn't win, despite its very careful uh, notation about where the pipes were supposed to be. Okay, and again, on the left, Adolf Loss, and on the right, Bruno Tau. Sorry about the resolution. And uh, there was another competition in 1980s, uh, the second Chicago Tribune Tower, where architects famous at that time also contributed with a, a tower. Interesting. Now, the Mueller Villa in Prague. Uh, didn't I show this one? I think I did. I did. You can tell that I am losing it, you know, sorry. But here there are the pictures. Again, very interesting. Uh, this part of the building, which is the stomach of the building and also the, the, the unconscious of the building uh, in a way. And it, it, it's here. It's here in the interior where the magic of his architecture happens, mainly. I don't understand, it's a deja vu, what is going on. So he declared, my architecture is not conceived by drawings, but by spaces, right. I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. For me, the ground floor, first floor do not exist. There are only interconnected continual spaces, rooms, halls, terraces. Each space needs a different height. These spaces are connected so that ascent and descent are not only unnoticeable, but at the same time, uh, are not only unnoticeable, uh, okay, but at the same time function. This is how he, what he wrote in 1930, so, um, you know, a few years before he died. Yes, I think it is true. He is concerned with spaces and he wanted to see an interconnectedness between various floors. furniture and we are approaching the end of the of the presentation uh, he built a lot of pieces of furniture some of them very very well done and very interesting uh, he also had the chance to work with great craftsmen you know uh, and such craftsmen still exist in vienna and this i love about vienna you can pass by little shops where people you know do you know, woodwork or repair even shoes. And I, I like this uh, very much about Vienna. The crafts are still respected and present in the city. And they don't care if there is a lot of disorder and the shop window is actually an agglomeration or a conglomerate of uh, thrown things there. It's a very interesting city. I, I love Vienna. And this, this uh, chair is also, you know, a Viennese, you know, because of the musical uh, uh, undulations of the, of the sides of the chair, and uh, it's, it's nice. And this is also different, and it's interesting because you see diagonally, you know, it's almost a polemical chair. Uh, it's a corner piece, but with four chairs, not with three, as you'd expect. So if you wonder a little bit how you position your, your legs there. Another one that is both domestic and whimsical and a little bit, uh, yeah, is uh, modern in the sense that it's whimsical and funny. This one is more sober. Now this one is, um, a table, I think, yes, a table with a myriad of uh, legs, you know, some kind of, uh, the, yeah, there is probably an animal that it could be associated with, or not an animal, an insect. And this is, uh, you know, uh, here we are beginning to deal with some something very serious, you know, a big piece, a lot of wood here, and a lot of uh, geometry, I love this, uh, this, this, this piece, you know, this cubistic, it's warm, it's wood, it's, uh, it's, it's well done. What, what can we say? And it's real wood, it's not uh, IKEA furniture.
I wonder what kind of buildings would you draw if you worked at such a desk? Maybe you do different kind of buildings than you do at a you know, banal uh, drafting board uh, supported by four thin uh, you know, legs or whatever. And now you see the two, we saw the Villa Duschnitz, that one that was a remodeling, and he designed two Teban stools, as they were called, are these. Kind of interesting too, and, and whimsical, with three legs. He designed two, I mean one, but you know, he made two, or they made two. And now this is the last thing that I show you, it's a competition entry that he did for the Babylon Hotel, the Grand Hotel Babylon in Nice. He didn't win and it was not built, but it was to be a big building. And um, yeah, maybe some reference to, to an extent to, I mean, to Babylon, obviously, but also maybe to the hang gardens of Babylon or even the Tower of Babylon or uh, some kind of. Uh, Mesopotamian ziggurats, quite large, you see, <laughs> it was supposed to be indeed a grand hotel, and grand it is, with lots of rooms. I remember I was once in such a hotel in, uh, in St. Petersburg, my god, the corridors were one kilometer long, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but very long, and they met at the corner with another very long corridor. It would, uh, here also you see, I mean, look at this corridor here. It's, uh, it is interrupted a little bit in the, in the center, but it's, it's quite long, long, you know, there are here 25 rooms or so. Anyway, yeah, this is the magazine where the, his entry was published. Uh, it looked like an interesting project, too bad was not built. And this is the last image of the presentation. Uh, and I, I thank you for your participation. And if you want to comment in any way, um, please do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the presentation. You're welcome. You know, I'm looking forward for the time when uh, at the end, because I don't know how many people are, you know, uh, participating, but I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the time when, at the very end, when I finish, and I say, you know, uh, you can comment or whatever. I turn on the this screen and I see that there is no one here except me. Anyway, that was it. We 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 paid homage to him. It will happen again in December. In fact. Today, I wanted to also launch the competition towards a new ornament. The text is written. Um, I got carried away by adding new things to, to this presentation. I neglected that. But on, in, on December, when it will be his birthday, um, and not any birthday, 150 years since his birth. So, um, you know, uh, it's kind of an important date, but you know it doesn't matter how much I, I, I appreciate and I like his work. I, it's hard for me to avoid the thought that this man was was actually sentenced because of something uh, that, by all standards, was not uh, a pleasant affair at all. I really <laughs> wonder. I really pardon. I really wonder how a man of his quality could lower himself so much to abuse three girls between eight and 11. And poor girls, you know, I mean, you know, taking advantage of them, you know, if you read what happened, it's almost unbelievable. And I, I don't understand, it's true, he, he got ill in, in the last part of his life. The last few years, uh, I don't know what he had, even some kind of, uh, sclerosis or, or paralysis even or but but I don't know I don't know it's still very very disturbing and the fact that he was sentenced uh, shows that 
you know, it was very severe what happened, and uh, it was acknowledged as such by the by the court. So that's why I said, you know, homage to Adolf Loos, and you know, uh, question and and question marks, because this is a um, you know there is a, a darkness about this that cannot be erased, you know. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter how brilliant the, the architecture, but when you think that the man who did it, the, uh, the, that architecture also, you know, uh, acted uh, in, 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 in such a way, uh, I don't know, what do you think? Can you ignore one's private life completely, if you can call it private life, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I, I became, I, I always liked Adolf Loss, but learning about this made me, made me, made, made, made me a little bit uh, uneasy. Yes, then I, I would like to talk about that because, I mean, he's not the only genius that also fails as a, as a human being in a way. I mean, I think you fail as a human being if you cannot actually, if you are doing, actually, he's a criminal in a way, isn't it? I mean, this this goes uh, also with Louis Kahn. I mean, didn't he, um, wasn't he guilty of harassment or maybe he was just um, brought to court because of harassment, sexual harassment? And I, I just wonder, is this to be ignored because they have contributed uh, so much to, to architecture and therefore they could do these kind of things and or I, I wonder myself I, I think this is not right but in a way um, what, what I don't know then what, what do you think about this and, and, and yet you pay homage to them in a way to celebrate their contribution but of course you mentioned also what they did but uh, it's, it's puzzling me sometimes so, so can geniuses do this is it is it allowed because they contribute something to the civilization? 